Hi, I'm Dave Snodgrass and you're watching Table Ready Gaming. I'd like to start today's episode off by first thanking Brent of Goobertown Hobby for the collaboration. That was a lot of fun and uh, I look forward to working with him more in the future. And secondly, I'd like to thank everybody that has recently come and subscribed to the channel. Uh, I think most of you have come from Goobertown recently. Uh, I'm really excited to see all of you here and I hope you enjoy this channel. And uh, I know Brent has grown a great community of just supportive folks over in his channel and I hope to do the same here. So if you ever have any questions about miniature painting or the hobby in general or RPG games, whatever, just listen down in the comments. I'll try to find the answer for them if I don't know it. Like I said, we've got a great community of people that would be happy to help out and see what we can do. So honestly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for watching. It really means a lot to me. So for today's video, what we're going to be doing is working on these pre-painted plastic miniatures. Uh, I, if you've been playing D&D at all, you might have seen some of these. Uh, they come out of the box looking just like this. Uh, very standard, I guess, okay, passable quality. Uh, a bunch of them on the table look great. Um, however, there's a few simple tricks that you can do that's really gonna take this pre-painted miniature up to the next level, and that's what I'm gonna share with you on today's video. As you can see, I've acquired three of the identical sculpts. And so they all look the same. But this is easy to change, and that'll make it easier for players to identify each monster and lead to more interesting gameplay. First thing you'll wanna do when working with these minis is scrub them. I use a sponge or toothbrush and just give them a quick bubble bath in some warm water with dish soap. This removes any film, dust, or mold release that's left on the model. These guys have been at the bottom of a plastic bag for quite a while, and once they're done, you can just towel dry them off. For the next part, you're going to want to be working with a sharp blade, so I'd encourage you to replace your X-Acto knife blade and start with a new one. These blades are crazy sharp but one of my worst battle scars in this hobby has come from an old, dull X-Acto blade, so, so be careful. Lastly, when you're throwing these blades in the trash, remember someone else has to handle them. Don't leave a surprise for your trash man. Wrap the blade in some paper or tape, or better yet, get a razor disposal box. So this next part shouldn't come as any surprise, because I like to rebase these minis to match the rest of my collection. Next, I need to clean up around the little guy's feet and get all of that old plastic base off. Again, rebasing these bendings are not necessary. This is just a personal preference of mine. You can skip this step entirely and still get some great results. After I got it all cleaned up, I needed to pin into the new base. I do this with a paper clip and Gorilla Glue Gel Super Glue. I'm also gonna use some accelerant to speed up the process. You may notice that I've been increasing the size of the base. While we're on the subject of basing, Let's take about another one of my pet peeves, and that's when a miniature's feet hang off the sides of the base. This is 100% personal preference, and I have to admit it makes all my bases a little larger. I'd probably find this more annoying if I used a grid in my combat on D&D games. I'm not going to tell you the right or wrong way to build a miniature, because at the end of the day, this is your collection. Make it your own, and don't be afraid to break the rules. Don't let others dictate your fun. Though something to be aware of if you plan on using minis in your RPG games, I think you should seriously consider resizing your grid to a 1.5 system or 38 millimeter grid instead of a one inch grid to accommodate the larger bases. Looking at the direction of new minis, I'm going to think dynamic poses and scale creep is here to stay, especially if you're using miniatures like from Age of Sigmar. One of these benefits of collecting minis for as long as I have is that you have an extensive box or bits box of leftover parts from old builds. Using these extra shields, weapons, helmets, and grubbins are a great way to customize pre-painted miniatures. For the next part, we'll need to trim and pin and glue these new bits to the bugbear. I decided to replace one of the maces and replace it with an axe head from an old Games Workshop Beastman kit. I also decided to give my bugbears an AC boost by arming them with shields. For my first shield, I combined a beastman shield with a spiky bit. That's probably from a Games Workshop KS kit, but I can't remember which one. Off the other weapon and used it as a grip on the shield. My third bugbear, I decided to give him a spear, and I used a chaos spear I found in the bits box for this. I had to cut the spear into two parts and pin it above and below the bugbear's hand. To make sure the spear was straight, I drilled an entire way through the miniature's hand. Ideally, I would have used one piece of wire to connect the top and the bottom of the spear. However, my hole was slightly too small, so pushing the brass rod into the model was difficult, so I used two pieces, 
but in the end, it works just fine. For the spear-wielding bugbear, I used an old Dark Eldar bit for his shield, and glued it pretty much the same way as I did on the other guy. This is another tip for you. If you're going to start kit bashing, don't be afraid to use parts from science fiction kits on fantasy kits, and vice versa. It's okay to cross the stream, so to speak. Also, don't be afraid to kit bash across manufacturers. As well, by doing this, you're going to create some truly unique miniature collection. The last part of the model assembly process, I decided to base these guys with the Vallejo basing medium. This will help bind their feet into the new base, and it also acts as another way to secure them to the base, and blends the whole model together. Here's how our bugbears look at this point. The last thing you want to do before painting these guys is lay down a solid coat of matte varnish. I don't know what kind of plastic is used in the pre-painted sculpts or what paint they're using, but the model paint I use doesn't want to stick to it. And your paints and washes won't behave correctly if you try to paint straight to it. I find laying down a nice layer of matte varnish works as a clear primer and really helps you get better results. I also covered the bare gray plastic with a paint on airbrush primer. If all you did was adding basing to your pre-painted plastic miniatures, I personally think that alone brings them to the next level. But I decided to take it even further. I decided I would keep my first bugbear close to the original color scheme. One of the benefits of these pre-painted minis and priming with a clear matte varnish is that you can just add to the existing paint scheme and you don't have to paint the miniature from scratch. This lets you turn your uh, decent monsters for your next RPG in a fraction of the time. I think I have a total of an hour and a half besides dry time on these three guys. So these are the paints I'm using for this model, plus some metallics from the Scale 75 and a few washes from Citadel. I started by preparing my wet palette. If you're unfamiliar with what a wet palette is, I suggest you watch this video in the top corner. For my first bugbear, I started by edge highlighting his leather armor. I did this with my Parasite Brown. I think this really made him pop and covered up some of the worst sins from the original paint scheme. With this guy, I want to show you how a very simple paint job can bring these pre-painted miniatures to the next level. So we're going to take a KISS painting approach, or keep it super simple. I feel like goblins are some of the coolest and most underrated monsters in the D&D multiverse. Personally, I don't use much of the standard goblin lore in my world setting. I just feel like another fantasy race being tricked into evil by their gods is just a little tired in the D&D lore. Plus, there's lots of inspiration to draw from, as we have a lots of variety of goblins in fantasy settings. Some of my favorite goblins in fantasy lore is the night goblins as depicted in Warhammer Fantasy. I love the idea of fungus-fueled madmen that are constantly plotting and scheming. If you're looking for inspiration on how to run goblins in your D&D games, I'd encourage you to look at these two videos, one by WebDM and the other by Monarch Factory, as they both discuss unique ideas on running goblins in a D&D or RPG game. Anyhow, let's get back to the paint job. So for these next few scenes, you'll notice I'm just picking out details that are on the model. I use some metallics from Scale 75 and the other paints I have on my wet palette. These pre-painted sculpts have a surprising amount of detail on them, out of the box. Unfortunately, your players will never really notice it because it's all painted the same color. Picking out these details will really improve the overall look of this miniature. While we're on the topic of details no one will notice, I want to send out a quick PSA. While the overall comments and support on this channel have been truly humbling, there has been a few viewers who have been trying to put me down because of my lack of skill, or mistakes shown on the camera. To this, I have two responses. First, I'm in a stable, healthy relationship with the love of my life. I have friends who are constantly supportive, and a family that has done more for me than I can possibly sum up in a simple YouTube video. In short, I'm not going to be upset by some stranger online. Your comments aren't even rustling my feathers. Heck, I'm a nerd. People have been making fun of me for my hobbies since I enrolled in school. You're not saying anything I haven't heard a hundred times already. Also, I'm a millennial. And while my generation gets a lot of crap for our participation trophies, I think in some cases they certainly apply. And mini painting is one of them. I'd say this goes for any hobby. Not everything in life needs to be a competition. Sometimes we should play a sport simply for the love of the game. Participation trophies weren't designed to give a generation a sense of entitlement and to tell them that they're special. They're designed to remind you that if you love what you're doing and it's bringing you joy, then you're already a winner. So if you're ever discouraged to pick up a brush because you think another YouTuber or hobbyist is a better painter, know that another person sucked for a long time to get this good. Every time you pick up a brush, 
know you're being awarded a participation trophy from Dave at Table Ready Gaming because you're improving your craft and finding some enjoyment out of an amazing hobby. This channel isn't here to boost my ego. I want to encourage you to find something you enjoy and do it for the sake of your enjoyment. And I hope that thing might be miniature painting, game design, or tabletop gaming. For my second part of my PSA is that my eyes don't see in 4K, or even 1080p for that matter. Even in all my well-lit hobby spaces, there are details I don't see until it's blown up on my monitor in 4K. I could get frustrated by this and use my channel as a tool to fix these details. Sometimes I even do just that. But usually I'm too excited about the next project, and so I move on, because in my mind, done is beautiful. If a career as a freelance marketing consultant has taught me anything, I don't get paid for designing a campaign. I get paid for delivering campaigns. So don't ever be discouraged by other people. Follow your passions in life. You can't be expected to be the best at anything when you first pick it up. And if you're ever worried about being ostracized for your interest, just remember the people who matter won't care, and the people who care don't really matter. Ha! And there you thought you were just watching a silly online video about painting D&D figures. Fooled you! Look how much better that mini is looking by simply painting those details different colors. Who knew a bugbear had such a lovely face? And best part of these minis is the eyes were already painted. Anyhow, once all the detail was done, I washed the entire mini in an army painter strong zone. This adds shadows to the minis and pulls it all together. We will need to matte coat this miniature after though, as it has a nice shine once it dries. For my second bugbear, I went ahead and painted his armor black. Obviously this is more work, but still not as much as starting from scratch. I then did a similar highlighting by brightening up my black by using a light tan. This creates a warm black instead of cool black. I should probably make a video on warm black versus cool black in the future. But for now, just know that warm black is a black highlighted with a warm color, like red, and cool black is a black highlighted with a cool color, like blue. If you'd like to hear more about this and other color theory, and how it applies to miniature painting, be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're notified. I've already mentioned that I love goblins, but you know, I've never really found a place for bugbears in my campaign setting yet. See, in my world, goblin is a catch-all for an orc half-breed. Orc blood is very potent in my world, and will mix with pretty much any other race. So a half-orc human will create a hobgoblin, a half-orc elf will create a trollkin, and a half-orc half-gnome creates a gremlin, for example. I use this as a way to justify the diversity in the goblin population, and why no two goblins really look alike. I don't know what a bugbear should cross with, but for right now, I'm thinking it's going to be an orc and a furbog. But I'm open to ideas, and would love to hear yours in the comments. Okay, back to easy painting tips for pre-painted minis. I just painted the rest of the plastic weapons with colors on my wet palette. I'm trying to work with a limited palette here as the goal of this project is to get these guys painted fast and on the table. And sometimes, working with too many colors can just really slow you down. See? This guy's new armor and weapons, he's looking like a whole new bugbear. He's ready to hit the town. Another piece of advice is that washing your pre-painted minis with a Citadel shade is an easy way to add hue and contrast to your pre-painted miniature. This paint will tint the original paint scheme, adding even more diversity to your pre-painted figs. For the last miniature, I decided to paint his fur a darker brown and dry brush it with a lighter version of it. I then edge highlighted the armor with a light tan instead of my parasite brown. And for some reason, I decided to paint his eyes as well. Not that there was anything wrong with the pre-painted eyes, I guess I'm just a glutton for punishment. Finally, I washed this mini in a Reichland flesh shade and also went back to the bugbear in black and washed his weapon and shield in the same color. So there you have it. Here's my finished minis. I just gave a matte seal layer and finished off the base with a grass flocking. I hope this video shows you how easy it is to take your pre-painted plastics to the next level. Well there you go, three little bugbears ready to go torment a party of players. I find these weapon swaps and color variations to make it so much smoother when running combat. Now players can say things like, I cast a fireball at the bugbear in the black armor, or I want to swing my axe at the dual wielding bugbear. Now it's up to you if you want to change the monster's stats to reflect the new weapon loadouts, or keep them the same. Personally, I don't use WYSIWYG models in my gaming. If you're not familiar with the term WYSIWYG, it stands for what you see is what you get. Players should be happy to have a model that simply represents the model. It doesn't need to do the unique loadout. Oh, 
And one more thing, this is just a reminder. You want to make sure you have a strong matte seal as a base layer. Because like I said, the plastic pretty much hates your paint. So you can see here where I didn't quite get the bugbear's foot covered and the paint didn't tick. Oh well, he's got a spot on his foot. We can call that character. Fear Achilles, the spotted bugbear. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Table Ready Gaming. I'm sure having a blast making these videos and nerding out with all of you. Again, I'd like to welcome all my new subscribers. I know most of you have come from Goobertown Hobbies. As you already know, Brent is an amazing human, and I consider myself very lucky to know him and to be able to work with him. We're already planning our next collaboration, so be sure to subscribe to both of our channels so you can double your chances of seeing it. Having each and every one of you here sure makes this YouTube thing a whole lot more fun. And if you enjoy what I'm doing, please support the channel by helping the Table Ready community grow. You can see links down below in the description on how you can do that. But the main thing is just share this video with your gaming buddies. Until next time, I'm Dave Snodgrass, this is Table Ready Gaming, and I'll see you in the next video.